the goodness of God. If you have your Bible, open it up to uh, Genesis 13. We've been on a series called Faith and Blessings. Faith and Blessings. How many of you know that God has plans? How many of you know that God's plans are higher than your plans? Uh, you probably wouldn't choose the things that, that God would choose. You haven't. You would say that there's something else I'd rather have or I'd rather do or, you know, probably something that's more about uh, making life good and um, comfortable, uh, profitable. Uh, we all want that. We would all want those plans. Nobody would not want those plans. But yet God brings those things to us in different, different ways. And um, we need to understand that he is worth trusting, that if he is God, and he is. And if he has a plan, <clears throat> and he does, and God in his nature doesn't know how to do anything other than be good and to be blessing, then we get to just bask in that. We just get that we don't we don't have to live every day with a question mark. We can live every day with an exclamation point. And we just need to learn that. Now, none of us come comes built for that. Uh, we have a sin nature, so we've been built for sin. Is that right? And uh, I've got my Ph.D. in it. So uh, I know exactly what that means. I know what it looks like. I know all those things. And yet, God has been very patient and loving and kind with me to help me get from where I am to where he wants me to be. And until the day that he ca carries me home, I'm going to be on mission with him. I'm going to be on this walk with him. Now, we've been studying Abraham and the, where we left off last week, Abraham's plans were different from God's plans. So Abraham took charge, and it led him to Egypt. It led him to lies, and he got kicked out. I mean, you really got to mess up to get kicked out of the country, right? Your visa is denied. You, we're going to build a wall between you and Canaan land. You can't come back. We don't want you around here anymore. Deported illegal alien that you are. Abraham, get out of here. Now, that's where our sin will take us. But God will be loving and kind and meet us there. So I'm going to allow you to remain seated, but let's read Genesis chapter 13 together. You ready? Say amen. amen. God's Word says, Then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had with Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich, in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Remember, he got part of that from his treachery in Egypt. But yet he had it. Now what was he going to do with it? Would he be a good steward of all the things that God had let come his way? And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to support them that they may dwell together, for the possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, literally like the garden of Eden, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zor. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of the Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. And the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, 
so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, there, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the timber tree of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Let's pray. Now, Father, as we come to your word, we know and we've already said you're the author of the word. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. There is no wisdom in me, Lord. All the wisdom is in the word. So, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come and take your word and illuminate it into our life and in our hearts. May we be open to it. Speak clearly and plainly and personally. And, Father, draw us from where we are to to your, be very close to your side. May we hear a, a word from you in a moment that will last for the remainder of our days. Father, we need this, we covet this, we pray for this. And Father, we are nothing without you, nothing at all that will last, that is meaningful and purposeful. It's just, as your word says, wood, hay, and stubble. But Lord, you do a work within us in our soul and our spirit that will live on forever. And for that, Lord, we praise you and we thank you. This 19th day of July in the year of our Lord 2020, may it be a great day of glory unto you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Abram leaves Egypt. Kind of, not, probably not in the way that he thought that he would leave. Probably you would say that it was a, maybe even a very shameful moment. He leaves with all the riches, but yet probably leaves a little bit in disgrace. Lot, his nephew, he has become rich as well. And he has much herds and flocks as well. And they make the begin to travel north, back to Bethel. Back to Bethel. That's the place God brought him in the first place. The God who had a plan for his life who led him directly to this particular place. And when he found it, he said, this is of God, and he built an altar there, and he began to worship God. There are times in our life that our wisdom and our ways will take us to places that God never wanted us to be. Maybe there was unrest within, our, within us. I always said of my father, my earthly father, the longest pastorate that he ever had was three and a half years, the longest one he ever had. Most of his pastors were between two years and two and a half years. My brother moved 11 times in the first 18 years. I was blessed a little bit better than that. I moved a pretty good bit until I was about 10 years old, and then I stayed in that house until I was 18. But I always said my dad had shifting sand under his feet. He would sit there for a certain while, then he'd come up with a thought or he'd come up with another uh, thing that he wanted to do, and he would travel after that. Some were good, some were not so good. Some were of God, some were probably not of God, but even then, God could take those things and make good out of it. You probably have not always made great decisions, but isn't it great that God will get us beyond our decisions back to our Bethel, back to our altar, Back to that place of closeness with God and worship with God and a time when, when God can lead us and direct us and, and help us along the way. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Where do you go when you're not sure what's next? I believe you pray about it. I believe you seek God. And I believe you begin to draw close to him and listen. Because it's God's plan and it's God's responsibility. If you're listening and you're seeking and searching, it's God's will to get you from where you are to where you need to be. God got Abram back from the place of Egypt back to the place that he needed to be in Canaan. You ever have anxiety? What's going to happen today? What's coming up? I don't know what's up. I don't know what's next. How do we handle the day? There was a, a man by the name of William Oster. He was a medical student, very profound, but very anxious student, very nervous. Matter of fact, he almost had a mental breakdown in college until he read 21 words 
from Thomas Carlyle. After those 21 words, it changed him. He went on to finish medical school. As a matter of fact, he began the John Hopkins School of Medicine. He actually went on to be knighted by the King of England, and he was the Regis Professor of the School of Medicine at Oxford. What were the 21 words that changed him? I wrote them down so I would say them exactly right. Thomas Carlyle said this, Our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. Our main business is not to do, or excuse me, is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. Anybody worried about a world? Anybody worried about what's next? Anybody worried about what the next decision is going to be? Where we're going to, I, and by the way, I'm thrust into this. I've been living this. You, you know the last four months have been very hard, but it's been very hard on me as well to uh, try to make sense out of nonsense. And everybody keeps asking me. There is not a week that goes by that someone doesn't ask me. When is it going to be normal again? When are we going to get back to? What's next, Pastor? And I appreciate that, and I understand those questions. And I always have the same reply. I haven't got a clue. I've made my, my mind up that I'm not going to make any decision over two weeks right now. Because I have no idea what is at a distance. I have no idea what's next. Matter of fact, I've come to realize and understand that's not my job. I was on a Zoom call with 11 pastors, excuse me, eight pastors. There were three that could not come. And I was, uh, our director of missions, Jojo Thomas, he's going to be with us in a few weeks. But um, <clears throat> we were on this Zoom call together, and we were talking about where we are, where we're going, all of the things that we were facing together. And one of them just broke down and started to explain how his life had just been absolutely torn apart and how he was nervous and really almost at a breakdown level. And uh, I, I said to him, brother, I know exactly how you feel. I know exactly how you feel. Uh, matter of fact, I made up my mind a couple months ago. Uh, I sent my family on vacation, and uh, I stayed here. And I made up my mind I was going to do. I was going to make my decision to get everything out of my life that didn't need to be there. I was going to just move down to the day by day, step by step trying to be faithful to what God has for me to do today. And can I tell you, my wife looked at me uh, probably only a couple weeks after that, and she said, you look more relaxed. And I said, well, amen, hallelujah, praise God. You know, and I, I, I can tell you I am. Now, I, Lynn and I are going to take a couple days off. I'll tell the whole church. We're going to take Monday and Tuesday, and we're going we're gonna to do something else. And uh, I'll be here Wednesday night. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of my responsibilities. I'll be at a moment's notice. Look, 34 years, I'm a phone call away. I understand that. But I also understand this. In the world in which we live, if panic is coming about what's next, we're allowing that to come on ourselves. God never intended that. The God is the author of the map, has this figured out. If he has plans of faith, to grow my faith, if he has plans of blessing, that I believe with all my heart God is a God of blessing, then I'm just going to trust him every step of the way. And I just think that that's where we need to come together. And, and, and the second thing I want to say to you is expect difficulties. Why is it that when something comes up that is a difficulty, it catches us off guard? It's like we've got our mind made up that, that everything's going to be just roses and rainbows. You know, there's another word for that. Baloney. 
correct? Look what it says in, in, in verse 6. The Lamb was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for the possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have such a problem of, I've got so much? Anybody like that? I mean, you've just so... God has blessed you so much out of your own stupidity and, and you've got so much you don't know what to do with it. You know, I wish I had that problem every now and again. But once again, I pray the prayer, uh, Lord, don't give me so much that I take you for granted or give me so little that I will steal. God knows what I can do in my life and that should be good enough for me. Verse 7, And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's lot and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock and the Canaanites and the Perizzites, they dwelt in the land. So here they are, back to where God wants them to be. They don't, that's not their land. It's called Canaan land because the Canaanites were there, the Perizzites were there. And here they are, and they've got all their flocks together and they're trying to get together and, and, and things just, just don't look right. They just don't make sense. I call this grazing guardrails. What are we going to do? How are we going to separate these out? Abram's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen were fussing and fighting. So look what it says in verse 8. So Abram said to Lot, please. Now, by the way, in one verse, you're going to see the word please twice. There's never a good reason to be rude. Even through difficulties, Abram said, please let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. So don't be knocked down by the difficulties. Just come together and seek to honor God. As a matter of fact, Abram is being very humble here. He could have said, all of this is mine, Lot. You're under me. But he didn't. Be very careful about grasping. We grasp when we think that we're going to lose something, so we hold on to it. Be very, very careful about grasping. You've heard me say this before. When you grasp and you're holding on to something, that's all you've got. But if you can live your life with the open hand, then God can put whatever into your hand that he wants or take whatever out of your hands that you want. It's up to him so the sovereign God knows what's right and good and best, and you can trust him. So Abram comes to this place where he's got this money, and he's saying, hey, I'm not worried about that. I'm going to turn it loose. The best thing is, Lot, that we have a good relationship, that I love God, but I love you. And I love you enough to, to, to let you make a choice. You make a choice. He says in verse 9, he said, please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the right. He says, listen, it's up to you. Come on now, church, look at me. Abram's saying, I'm okay either way. That's trusting God. You take whatever you think you want. Verse 10, Lot lifted his eyes and saw the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zor. And Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. Abram, he didn't say, this is mine, you take that. He trusted God. He trusted the sovereign Lord. And he said, you just choose. Even though Lot was making a choice, do you understand God was in it? Even though there are choices that are being made for us, God's bigger than that. Well, I just don't think. No, hold on. You don't have to think. God's got it. And it might not fit you initially, but God will lead you to places of blessing. And if you looked on the east side of the Jordan River, it was beautiful and it was lush, like the Garden of Eden, it says. And it was perfect 
for flocks and for herds. As a matter of fact, when the children of Israel, after they left Egypt and they came back, and they were after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and before they were ready to go across the Jordan River and to take the, uh, the, the land, the Canaan, Canaan, land of Canaan, remember there were two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and a half tribe of Manasseh. They said, hey, we don't want to go. We'll just take our side on the east side of the Jordan River. Moses said, yeah, you're going to go. Now, if you want this to be yours, I'm fine with that. But you're going to go fight the battles. And if you don't go fight the battles, understand this, be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers chapter 32. But they did. They, the armies of the men of Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, they crossed over. They went and they, they did every battle. They went to Jericho and they did every battle. And after everything was done, and they got to cross over the Jordan River back to the east side, and that's where they kept their herds. It was a beautiful place. And Lot said, I think that's where I'd like to be. It was his choice, but it was a dangerous choice. Now, it might not have seemed a dangerous choice in the, in the beginning because in Canaan land where Abraham was left, the Canaanites were there and the Perizzites were there. Understand? The termites were there. All of them were there. It didn't look good. It looked dangerous. It looked hard. But where Lot went, pitched his tent towards Sodom. Y'all ever heard of Sodom and its other sister city, Gomorrah? Matter of fact, the Word of God calls it evil. Be careful of associating with evil. Be careful. Your decisions will take you places God may not want you to be. <clears throat> There's one last point I got for you. After Abraham was humbled and he, he said, you just take it all that you want. Lot moved to the east. Look in verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are. I pray that in the next few seconds, the only one who can actually make this point well is the Holy Spirit. But I pray that you'll look at this and trust God in the next few moments. And I pray that we'll have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit would have us to hear. Because I think God in 2020, to us right now, is saying, lift your eyes up now. Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are. Have y'all ever thought this? You know, if only this, then good can happen. If only this would happen. I guarantee you I have met so many people who were looking for an election in November to decide what their next four years are going to be. My God's already won the election in my heart. He is my Lord. He is my King. I will bow my knee before Him. And no matter what happens in Washington in the next four years, I'm going to be good. And I don't know what this corona is going to do. I don't know what if it's going to be a pandemic, an epidemic. I don't know if it's going to be a, just a emic. I don't know what the next thing is going to be, but I tell you what, my God is still the God of creation that's on the throne. He has me here. He has me now. I don't need to add anything to my life. I just need to trust what He's laid before me. He is sovereign. He is God. He is able. He is good. His nature does not know how to do anything except that which is best. I'm not looking for myself or by you or for anybody else to add to me, and then I'll get it. I've got it now. I am sufficient in Christ and Christ alone. 
I have Calvary, I have forgiveness, I have eternal life, I have love, I have blessings, I have joy, and the more faith that God will place before me, the more I can see of his goodness. I'm not worried about all those other things. I'm just going to trust the Lord with all my heart. Lean not into my own understanding. In all ways, in every way, in every day, in every moment, in every circumstance, in every situation, I'm going to acknowledge him and let him lead my path. He's the only one that can get us from where we are to where we need to be. We used to sing a song years ago, I feel like traveling on. My destination's set. And it's going to be good. And when I get home, I don't ever have to leave. And it's going to be beyond anything that I'm grasping here. When God's trying to get me to release so that he can fill me and bless me. Y'all listen to me. I get to walk it out today. I don't get to just preach it. I get to walk it out today. How many of you know what's going to happen tomorrow? Anybody anxious? Anybody read the Sermon on the Mount? Did Jesus have anything to say about not worrying about tomorrow? I mean, does the Word of God say be anxious for what? Say it again. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. I mean, all we, we got enough to pray over. Y'all good with that? But when you pray, you're putting it in His hands. Then you get up and you walk it out. Listen to this. God, help me. Lift your, eye, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. I believe that covers it all. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants. God says, I give to your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, not dust in the wind. I don't care what Kansas said. I'm not just dust in the wind. I got purpose for my life. But he's saying it cannot be counted. Then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise. Walk in the land. Get up and let's walk it out here in Gainesville, Georgia. Wherever you go, God's there. Through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Years ago, Jerry Falwell when he began the ministry, Thomas Rowe Baptist Church, they took a mountain there. They took a hill. I guess you'd call it a hill. Jerry Falwell said at the very beginning of his ministry, he would walk that. He said every step he took, he was claiming it that God had given it. By the way, they got it all. Lynchburg, Virginia is known for Liberty University. 15,000 students strong. As a matter of fact, my daughter's in her master's right now taking classes online from Liberty University because a man of God walked it out claiming and believing that God had a plan for his life. See, God had put it on his heart. He just believed that God who put it on his heart could make it happen. I'm going to say this as plainly but as boldly as I know how. There's some things that God has placed on your heart that you know are God, that you need to boldly claim and walk it out. And that's God's word for us today. God got us here. He'll take care of us here. Let's pray. Now, Lord, all is vain unless you do not come, unless you come, unless the Holy Spirit speaks with power speaks with an anointing it speaks to us personally father i remember when i prayed and i cried out to you and i asked you to save me you took those words and you made them alive within me father i pray that even now that you do that again not salvation 
O Lord. But Lord, we would listen. And in the same way, Lord, we would move from our spirit to your spirit. Repent of following our way and seek to follow your way. And God, we're asking you to do a God work in our life. Move us away from anxiety and questions. And Lord, let us move the, remove the question mark and put an exclamation point down. You're good. You're God. And we are blessed. We are so very blessed. Father, the world has no answers. So I understand why they are so broken and miserable and lost. But Lord, you are the answer and we know you. And God, we claim it. You promised. So Lord, take us from where we are to where we need to be and begin it even now in our spirit. Lord, bless us in this moment. Call upon our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.